Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I am Prabhakar Parinivel. I am a consulting engineer uh, in Oracle uh, Cloud Infrastructure. So uh, what is in it for you, right? Like uh, why you have to spend next 30 minutes here? So um, I would touch upon a few internal aspects of ITCD and um, we would share some of the learnings we had over the last seven, eight years operating uh, tens of uh, thousands of ITCD clusters. And um, as we evolved, we re-architected our um, HCD ar architecture. So we will talk about how we went about re-architecting and also migrating the HCD deployment from the legacy architecture to the new architecture. And also we'll talk about some of the learnings when we did this uh, migration from the legacy to new architecture. Just a very brief uh, uh, introduction. So. Uh, like I said, I work with OCI, and OCI has a global infrastructure across uh, the globe with multiple regions. And in each of these regions, uh, OKE, which is our managed Kubernetes offering, is a day one service. And there are um, multiple uh, internal as well as external applications are onboarded to OKE. And in fact, many of the OCI services run on top of OKE itself. So uh, with the uh, growth in the adoption, uh, we were looking at operational efficiencies. And one uh, thing we identified was to improve the way the HCD was deployed and operated. Like, you know, each OKE cluster has a backend HCD. And uh, hence, we need to find a way to operate it better, to operate Kubernetes better. So we went through this journey of re-architecting uh, and uh, at this moment, we completed the migration to the new architecture with um, zero customer uh, reported issues. I think uh, having a, um, a great uh, engineering team really helped, but the equal credit goes to the ITCD SIG because of the high bar they maintain with respect to the patch releases and major releases they make. Because we had uh, ITCD clusters running all the way from ITCD 3.3 to now uh, 3.5.x. But we could do all those migrations with zero customer escalation. So I just want to thank the it's uh, SIG for their uh, focus on the high bar they maintain. So start to start with some brief inter uh, uh, it's city internals. As you all know, uh, distributed uh, it's city is a distributed key value store. Uh, I do hear that some folks run as a single member at city in production. I don't know. I don't believe that, but I do hear it <laughs> from some of my friends. But it doesn't make sense run, uh, running a single uh, member at city uh, in production. Yeah, it has to be a distributed key value pair. And um, it city uses gRPC for both its client as well as peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication. Um, and you would know it, it internally uses uh, HTTP2, so in case you are interested. <laughs> um, so... Uh, Raft is the heart and soul of its city. So many features you think is feature of its city is actually inherited from uh, Raft. So like I said, uh, its city is a distributed key value store. So you need to have a consensus between the its city members. So the consensus is through Raft. So Raft defines, for instance, how the uh, uh, replication of updates happen. Uh, it, it defines that it has to be a leader-based replication, basically. It defines how um, the leader election is done and such uh, things. So how Raft works is it treats uh, the system that it manages as a replicated state machine. So and it defines how the updates to that state machine is done. So uh, internally it's a, it has a concept of replicated logs as well as uh, in data st uh, state basically. So and it can controls the update. First the update goes to the replicated logs and then it, uh, that is what is called as committing the update. And then this update goes to the backend store, which is called applying the update. So th those are um, raft terms inherited into its city. So within its city, we use uh, bbolt for storing the state. So that's why uh, you'd be surprised. You have uh, newbies might be surprised that we have a key uh, key value store inside another key value store. It's because its city is like a distributed key value store. Under under that, each of the members have a, a standalone key value store. In our case, it's a bbolt. So now I would uh, jump into how uh, we did, uh, I mean, uh, I'll start with how my uh, uh, legacy architecture looked and then how our um, uh, new architecture looked. And then in the subsequent slides, I will dive deep into the migration process and our learnings and other things. So 
what you see in the screen right now is the legacy architecture. The vertical uh, rectangular boxes you see in the left, they are all the control planes of our Kubernetes clusters. So each control plane has three compute instances. And uh, in, the, in our legacy architecture, we only run the Kubernetes uh, containers there. And what you see in the right side is our uh, internally managed Kubernetes cluster, where we run its CD as its CD pods. You can think of it as a variant of a Kubeception model, where uh, we run its CD uh, pods on, on an internal uh, cluster for the customer's uh, Kubernetes clusters. And uh, we had an internal uh, gateway, which was um, uh, 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 Envoy-based. And since we use TLS everywhere uh, the, for communication between the QBIPA server and the HCD, uh, we, uh, we used the SNI um, uh, in, uh, mechanism in, um, supported in Envoy to route the traffic to the right HCD store. Like if one of these uh, Kubernetes clusters want to uh, talk to uh, their corresponding HCD data store, they would talk to the gateway, and the gateway know, uh, knows which HCD to forward to using the SNI mechanism. And in our uh, internal cluster, we ran the core OS-based HCD operator for maintaining the lifecycle of the HCD pods as well as for the backup and uh, restore uh, mechanism. So as part of the migration, what we did was uh, we decided to move the HCD members into the uh, control planes which constituted the, uh, I mean, the compute instances which constituted the control planes. So like I said, we had uh, three compute instances. So we moved three copies of the HCD uh, into those compute instances. So each control plane uh, talks to the corresponding local HCD. In our case, the QPAPI server, which is running in that compute instance, only talks to the corresponding HCD. So we do that for all the members, and once all the members are migrated, we dismantle the corresponding uh, legacy architecture in the given region. So um, now I would talk about uh, the improvements that we made. So we were operating this legacy architecture for seven, eight years, and then we decided to migrate to this new architecture. So we obviously had some learnings along the way. I listed a few of those here for uh, uh, the space constraints, so there are much more I could add. So the first and foremost, right, uh, we continuously patch our nodes and, uh, for uh, security updates and things like that. So we have to make that error, uh, error, error uh, less error prone and simplified. So what we did was every uh, we assigned a permanent identity to the its CD as well as a permanent uh, storage. This is a fancy way of saying we created DNS entries and block volumes and assigned to these HCD members. Every time we go and create a, a Kubernetes cluster, we provision three DNS names as well as uh, three block volumes. And we bring up three compute instances, attach the block volume, and assign the corresponding DNS entry. Le uh, next month, when I'm patching those uh, control plane compute instances, all that I need to do is to terminate this compute instance, bring up a new one, and attach the block volume and DNS entry there. From the perspective of the other HCD members, it's just a blip. The member disappeared for a few seconds and it came back because I have nothing has changed because the identity and the persistent storage is exactly the same. So this significantly simplified our uh, operational uh, process. And other thing that we learned from the day one is uh, one size fits all doesn't work because we have clusters with one uh, worker nodes and some with thousands of worker nodes. So we cannot expect the operators to jump in and tune the compute resources or memory or IOPS for the block volume. So we built in the auto tuning from the day one. So uh, we continuously monitor the cluster characteristics. And if we see that, OK, this uh, cluster is much larger than I thought, so I, I, we would automatically scale up the uh, compute instances, memory, and as well as the IOPS assigned to the block volumes. So 2GB is the default uh, quota set for HCD. So I spoke about the B-Bolt. So the B-Bolt uh, has its in internal backend storage. So this quota setting, uh, which is by default 2GB, limits the size of that backend store. So uh, initially, in, the, in our legacy architecture, 2GB was sufficient. But as we evolved and grew, uh, we consistently hit that limit. And the operators get alarmed. They jump in. They do a defrag, and then uh, possibly increase the quota. It was, uh, it was unnecessary. So what we thought from the day one, we would set the quota as 8GB. 
In fact, uh, we are talking to the uh, 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 SIG team, the city SIG team, to even consider increasing it to 16 GB. Maybe 8 GB is too old for today. Uh, uh, with the size, uh, uh, the size of the clusters, maybe a 16 GB or a 20 GB makes sense. Hopefully, the city uh, SIG team might uh, prioritize that. N another important thing with operating its city is the I/O latency with respect to disks. So we uh, c uh, now uh, we have built in the monitoring of its city, and we continuously monitor the backend lat latency. So we have alarms configured against the block volumes provision, and uh, based on the alarms, the operators uh, jump in and then scale up the IOPS assigned to the block volumes. And lastly, uh, defrag is one of the uh, uh, critical operation which as you know, can momentarily pass a uh, city member. So um, we have more intelligent ways of defragging now. Uh, in our legacy architecture, what we used to do is to we, we wait for the quota to be hit and the member uh, and the alarm to be raised, and then the operators would jump in and do a defrag. Now we incorporated the automatic uh, defrag in our code, and we do it in a much more intelligent manner because uh, running uh, this in an uh, unplanned manner may bring down the um, its city cluster because it's a like they say it's a stop of the world operation. During the defrag time, that member is completely unavailable. If you are doing a defrag for the leader, then it is quite possible that the leader doesn't send the right heartbeats to the other members. And you end up losing the leader election. I mean, you triggering the leader election and all those things. So we have to tune the way we do the defrag so that we have uh, incorporated. And now we, are, uh, based on our discussion with the uh, SIGIT city, we are uh, tuning it even further. So I will uh, take a couple of slides about our migration process. Uh, uh, one thing is obviously it has to be a zero uh, data loss uh, uh, migration. No questions about that. And it has to be a zero downtime migration. So the Kubernetes control plane has to be available throughout this migration. Our intent is the customer is not even aware we are doing the migration. The uh, only thing that we do uh, which, the customer, which is observable to the customer is the customer cannot delete the cluster during the migration. So we typically take about 10 minutes per cluster. And of course, we do migration in a concurrent manner. But during that migration, you cannot delete the cluster. But we thought that's not a major limitation. It provides additional safety for us. So we uh, prevent a deletion from happening. But otherwise, the customer can do anything he wants. Uh, and he wouldn't even be aware that migration is happening in the background. background. And uh, like I said, uh, considering the scale of the deployment, it has to be fully uh, automated. Operators cannot jump in and do a cluster, I mean, specific operation. You see, set up the migration infra for uh, environment, and uh, it takes care of everything. And a uh, couple of important things. While doing the migration, we had a choice of updating the HCD to a latest version, for instance, to 3.5, because uh, Many of the new features would have helped us to do the migration in a much more simpler manner. For example, there's a new concept called follower model, where you can add a new member as a follower, and then wait for it to catch up with the data and do a promotion. So that would have simplified our job. But um, we wanted to stick to the best practices. For example, for three dot, uh, I mean, for older versions like 1.15 or 1.14 of Kubernetes, we have to use corresponding older uh, HCD versions. So uh, we didn't want to deviate from those uh, best, uh, best practices. So it complicated our migration code, but uh, we wanted to still do that because we, we didn't want to have any surprises by deviating from the best practices. And lastly, uh, uh, leader election is pretty bad, particularly for software and particularly for HCD. Uh, so uh, we don't want to do frequent leader, leader elections. Let's say you are migrating the leader uh, again and again, you'd end up triggering two, three leader elections during the city uh, migration. So we consciously uh, uh, took steps to ensure that the each city uh, leader election doesn't happen during the migration. The only time it happens is when you're done with the migration and you're dismantling the legacy architecture. Yeah, the orchestrator had uh, inbuilt capabilities to do uh, yeah, fine-grained uh, uh, migration. So we had mechanism to do migration in a given window and we had uh, concurrency control, like th these many clusters are migrated at a given point in time. We usually start with one or two migrations, and then we scale up all the way to 20. Um, and most important thing is it automatically blocks the migration if there is any failure, because we uh, want the operator to jump in and mitigate the migration and understand whether it's a region-wide uh, issue or a specific uh, 
um, uh, cluster issue. So we automatically block the migration on first failure. And another value add, I mean, another important thing was to run a migration canary, which is uh, like a test application outside this migration window. There are so many things that happen outside the window, like uh, there are so many dependencies we depend on, like block, block volume, DNS, etc. Things can change overnight. So outside this migration window, we periodically run the canary, and if something goes wrong, we immediately uh, block the migration, and the SME has to jump in and see that, OK, the migration can be unblocked now. So that really helped us uh, in many ways, because may, there are many new changes that are rolled out, which we haven't validated with. If it breaks, we don't want to do it with production cluster. So we run migration in a given window and do the migration canary in the rest of the time. And for each stage of the migration that I would show in the next slide, uh, we had specific alarms and matrices. So that way, we get specific alarms and the corresponding run book so that the the, uh, folks can jump in, the operators can jump in and know exactly what they need to do and potentially engage the right SME because the alarm and run books are very specific. So now I will take uh, next few seconds to show how we did the migration at a very high level. So this is just one cluster. Like I have one control plane in the left with three compute instances running Kubernetes control plane. And in the right, I have one uh, HCD cluster. So first thing we do is we uh, uh, allocate the block volumes and DNS entries and assign to this control plane. Because before we moved to this new architecture, these compute instances which hosted the control plane were pretty much stateless. In the sense, they didn't have uh, any uh, uh, anything associated with them, like block volumes or uh, the DNS names. So first, before even we proceed with the migration, we are attach the block volumes and assign the DNS entries to those compute instances. Then uh, we scale up the HCD data store to five members. Uh, this is because by default we run with three, but we want to be more resilient during migration. So we scale it up to five members. And the black uh, icon corresponds to the leader just to show that we won't touch the leader till the end. And then before we do any mutation to the system, we take a snapshot into the, uh, into the object storage. We do have our core OS based uh, it's the operator running, taking the snapshot, but we wanted to do it just in time before touching the members for migration. And then we go about moving one member at a time uh, uh, and, uh, into the newer, uh, newer environment. So every time we do that, we first ensure that all five members are healthy. And then we go and move, uh, move this uh, uh, first member. And the same thing we do repeatedly for the subsequent members. Once all the members are uh, moved and healthy, we dismantle the objects uh, for this cluster in the new uh, environment. I mean, in the legacy environment. And once all the clusters are migrated, we dismantle the corresponding uh, legacy uh, uh, cluster that we had, which hosted the HCD pods. Now I would uh, jump into uh, the, some of the issues that we ran in, uh, into. So I will start with the DNS resolution issue. This, I mean, I can talk about this for the next 15 minutes, but I will try to uh, simplify it as, reasonable, as simple as possible. So uh, we, I started off with the premise that we always ensure that all five members are healthy before uh, we touch a member. So our assumption is we are going to manipulate one member, the rest four are healthy, so our, uh, uh, all our five members are healthy. Uh, I mean, even if that member doesn't come up, the member which is being migrated, the rest four are healthy, so the, compute, uh, the control plane would not be impacted. So that was our premise. But in this case, what happened was when we start the migration of the first member, all five members started crashing. We don't do anything with those members, but all of them are uh, crashing uh, with the error, uh, fail to update, a uh, member is unknown. So I need to set some context on this. Uh, again, uh, like you would expect, again, this is narrowed down to DNS, but yeah, uh, uh, blame it on DNS. Um, but I would uh, elaborate why it uh, uh, happened like this. So what uh, we have things of, OK, let me go to the, yeah, this will give a uh, context, right? So let's say I'm moving one member at a time to the uh, new environment. So the way the me uh, member in the new environment talks to the legacy environment is uh, through this gateway. And we ran code, uh, core DNS in a wildcard mode where it looks for a suffix. And if that suffix is there, it will route the traffic to that gateway. 
the idea is in the legacy environment the part the each city parts don't have their identity they are basically the pod names they typically end with svc.cluster.local so we had this wildcard code dns supports this wildcard based uh, the dns resolution so we had configured saying that okay if it is star.svc.local route it through the city gateway so a member in the new environment wants to talk the, to the peer in the new environment uh, or the legacy environment it queries the code dns code dns gives the ip address of the gateway and through that it talks to the uh, it's city pod running in the legacy environment but the member which is in the new environment when it wants to talk to the other member in the new environment uh, we have the dns name assigned right so based on that it communicates so there is no core dns involved there our bcn dns gets the query and then it translates it and it communicates locally but what happened in our case was uh, uh, when a new, uh, so let's say I take, uh, i'm adding a new member and i am bringing up, bringing up the new member the member b builds up a member table and it has a key value pair uh, so key corresponds to the dns name of the it's city, uh, the peer it's city member and the cluster uh, member id the basically the member id assigned to that member so it tries to build that uh, first it builds it with default values which are basically sha hash based it creates a sha and builds that member table and then it talks to the um, peers in the cluster and queries the table uh, queries the cluster id so that it could get the valid cluster ids so and then tries to update this member table so for that it uses a concept of url comparison the idea is you don't compare the dns names directly you translate the dns names and if the ip address you get is same then these two urls are same so that is the idea of url based comparison instead of string based comparison it does this basically a dns resolution and sees okay the two ips are same so it's uh, this is the right value i will update that corresponding entry but in this case what happened was when a new member is coming and it's trying to translate it we, uh, when it's trying to translate one of its local members the query goes to the vc and dns in some high load the dns translation fails and uh, uh, so it, uh, it falls back and it, it queries the core dns and core dns gives the gateway ip address and that end, ends up in messing up the table which is maintained by the hcd member so um, this again depends on the again the, this behavior is not well defined in the library so if you say how it uh, glibc works versus how muzzle library works the behavior is different in case of go library it uh, works more similar to glibc so just to add more context in in terms of uh, translating right we have two uh, two things you uh, basically one is n dots and the search domains n dot says that the number of dots that should be present in the dns names if the dns name doesn't have these many dots i will append the search domain and then do a resolution say for example you are trying to resolve kubernetes dot default and i set the n dots to be 5 kubernetes dot default as one dot so i uh, immediately uh, the library knows oh i have to query the search domain and append and do the resolution so that is the purpose of n dots and search domains this is very common and uh, issue this is the cause of many issues uh, uh, as well so uh, with uh, the way the libraries uh, handle this is different from one library to the other if uh, say for example bazel library if the dns name has enough dots already it wouldn't even fall back to append the search domain and do a resolution but uh, glibc or uh, uh, in our case go library what they do is first they try to do the resolution with the actual dns name even if it has enough dots uh, if the dns resolution fails let's say the upstream dns times out they will append the search domain and try to do the resolution because of that uh, behavior we were exposed because we were trying to uh, we have enough dots in the original dns name so we are querying for some reason the upstream dns failed and our library thought okay it's uh, i will fall back and do append this svc.cluster.local and our core dns responded to this uh, based on its wildcard based translation and gave the gateway ip address so this totally messed up our table and uh, all five members started crashing luckily for us we created this issue in pre prod so we got away with it um, and then we ad adjusted our search domain so that we don't face this issue we have created uh, this uh, issue against it city so that uh, 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 so basically how the other members perceive this is they are getting a connection from an unknown cluster uh, member id 
So ideal expectation is when a member uh, is connecting to you is an unknown thing, you should just ignore the connection and get on with it. But here they are logging a message saying that it's an unknown member and they are crashing. So we have raised a ticket against uh, uh, its city so that folks can look at it and we would also try to help them in this. I'll move on with uh, uh, other uh, issues. Uh, um, so other issues are much more lighter, so you can relax, I guess. So, um, um, so the, uh, we have a, a peer TLS enabled everywhere, right? Like both for uh, client communication as well as peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication. Uh, so, which the peer -to -peer uh, so every time a peer tries to communicate with another peer, the receiver ensures that the certificate is valid. It does few things. It tries to do a DNS resolution of all the entries in the subject alternate name. It also does a reverse lookup of the source IP to ensure basically a DNS PTR request and ensure that it finds the entry the subject alternate name. It works fine in a flat environment where uh, all the peers are in the same uh, say same subnet. But in this case, uh, legacy and new architectures are communicating through a gateway. So the source IP is not going to match because the source IP is always going to be the gateway's IP when the legacy architecture is receiving the request. So uh, the only way out for us was to disable this validation. Uh, initially, we had concerns maybe this is a security issue, but uh, fortunately, we had uh, our VCNs with the right uh, uh, secless rules so that only these two VCNs can communicate. So we are OK with uh, uh, opening this up. And we disabled this uh, SAN validation during the migration. And another learning we had is uh, HCD aggressively does this DNS resolution. So we did not remove this. So our uh, peer TLS had the entries for both legacy and new environment. But uh, once the migration is done, the legacy environment's DNS names are invalid. But every time there's a connection from the peer, it, does, it tries to uh, validate the uh, DNS entry of the peer uh, uh, members. That overloaded our VC and DNS team, and they noticed that there is a spike in the uh, uh, low, uh, DNS queries coming from our tenancy. So, and then we fixed it by uh, making appropriate changes. So, the important uh, takeaway is to uh, keep the certificate free of corrupt uh, and remove whichever entry is in the irrelevant to that environment. So, um, I spoke about this follower model. So, where uh, when you, let's say, when you add a new member, uh, uh, what you typically do with the follower uh, model is you add a new member and uh, uh, wait for it to catch up with the data and then promote it as a regular member instead of a follower. Uh, but uh, we, since we are not using that follower model uh, uh, we, because we wanted to have uh, support for older HCD versions, uh, what we were relying on is the health checkup. But health check is not meant for this purpose because I have listed down the things that it does as part of the health checkup. First, it ensures that there are no HCD alarms, uh, like no space alarm or uh, corrupt alarm. And it ensures that the cluster has a leader. And finally, it does a quorum read. You might be aware there are two kinds of reads in HCD. One is uh, linearized read, and the other is serialized read. So linearized read is as good as uh, write. It tries to read from a, maj a majority, a quorum of members, and then acknowledge the, and give back the read. So um, by default, uh, the health check does a quorum re uh, or a linearized read. Uh, but you have an option to disable it and make it as a serialized read, where it just reads from that member and respond back. So this is what it does. Uh, ideally, a quorum read should have been sufficient, but we were not very convinced because it could be possible that there are some issues with the older versions of its city. So the way we went about, went about is, uh, I spoke about this raft uh, uh, indices, like commit index and applied index. So you can query those commit index and applied index from the HCD. Like I can query a member and say, what is your current commit index and uh, applied index? So using that, we ensure that, OK, a new member has actually caught up uh, uh, with the existing members by comparing this applied index. And then we proceed with the uh, next member. So we are pretty certain that the migration for that member is done. Yeah, these are minor issues, but I will still mention it here. So uh, unlike other key value stores or maybe other databases, uh, HCD expects that uh, you have enumerated all the HCD members when you are bringing up a new member. If there is any mismatch, it will start at the very beginning. Ideally, I would have expected I will talk to any one member and get the updated list. 
But if the list that is provided as a CLI, uh, I mean, as a command line parameter in bringing up the its CD, the bring up itself fails. So uh, initially, our uh, our orchestrator was populating the CD pod uh, manifest. Basically, we run the uh, pods in a headless mode, where uh, in our control plane uh, we uh, put push the CD pod manifest, and Kubelet picks it up and uh, uh, runs the pods. So uh, we were initially populating it with the members, but let's say there are something happening in the legacy environment, pods get uh, recreated or things like that. This uh, there is a mismatch, and the pod doesn't come up. So we uh, moved this uh, enumeration as part of the startup endpoint of the HCD itself. Um, uh, again, uh, we didn't want to build a special HCD member uh, image for migration because uh, new Im images get rolled out and we don't want to uh, 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 get caught in the process. So what we did was we had uh, init containers which come in first and push to the uh, scratch uh, volume and then we made HCD pick that in it, uh, entry point. So that sort of thing. So we leveraged the existing HCD image, but uh, we had additional init container which was pushing these additional configuration files for initializing uh, the member. So uh, one last uh, issue, I hope I will have time to finish this. Uh, let's say when you are adding a new member, right? So we have, there are few things which are enforced. First is, if you add a new member, it wouldn't break the quorum. And another thing is, uh, all the existing members are healthy. So the, uh, uh, these two, uh, I mean, uh, so the second, uh, the first issue which ensures that the quorum would not be lost makes sense because uh, we don't want to break an existing cluster while adding a new member. But the second issue, uh, basically, uh, the restrictions on adding members uh, kind of bit us. Because let's say we are doing a migration. In the new environment, we are bringing up a new member. But let's say something goes up, uh, goes bad in the legacy environment, and the operator jumps in and tries to add an uh, add a member there. So the addition of the member fails because uh, the HCD sees, oh, there are two member additions being tried. I'm not going to uh, support this member addition. So uh, that bitters, uh, but there are ways to disable this. But unfortunately, uh, the flag that was provided disables both uh, 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 both these features, like basically preventing the quorum loss uh, as well as preventing multiple member additions. So we decided to live with it because we don't want to lose quorum. But uh, operator has to jump. If something goes wrong, the operator has to jump in and manually remove one member to unblock the migration. Yeah, these are uh, I, basically to call out that uh, one, one good thing the HCD SIG team does is uh, it does a good job of backporting many of the features to the uh, older patch releases all the way to 3.3. That really helped us uh, because uh, so when we started out, only thing we needed to ensure is for each of those minor releases, uh, we are in the uh, right patch release. Uh, so that really helped us with uh, our process. Yeah, this uh, concludes my uh, presentation. I have two minutes, so if there are any queries about uh, HCD or with the migration process, uh, I can try to uh, answer. Thanks, good talk. Um, a couple of things, the, the whole DNS search domain fiasco. Um, I've seen this as well, and I think all, over time we started just uh, putting dots on the end of the host names to avoid search domains in the first place from, from exploding the number of queries. Um, but my question is more about actually the, the persistent volumes um, and the choice to use persistent back, backing for etcd. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like when you are doing the migrations, those persistent volumes aren't coming with you anyway. Is that correct? Um, so in our legacy architecture, we did not use block volumes because we are packing too many uh, HCD parts in one member, and you can't attach, for example, 40 block volumes to a computer instance. It depends, again, on the shape of the computer instance. So there, uh, we were relying on the scratch storage for the backend data, but our backup operator was ba backing the da uh, data, and we had a RPO of 15 minutes. So it, it was taking the backup. So in legacy environment, the data was in the scratch storage. But in the new environment, uh, we didn't want to have that because 15 minutes of RPO is too much. So we decided to have uh, 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 assigned block volume for each of the HCD members. So that's why when during the migration, we had to create the block volumes. Gotcha. Yeah, that's along the lines of what I was wondering is if I, the, the performance difference and, and the, like, the, the IO latency that you'd be able to get <clears throat> from using local NVMe versus persisting everything to a disk. Um, I guess the trade-off of that versus uh, you know, 
if you lose the data, you're just relying on etcd's HA um, in the first place to, to recover. Right. That was a worthwhile trade-off. Right. So yeah, like I said, we do monitor the latency of the block volumes, and we have uh, uh, the block volume provides all the IO throttling uh, thing. Like if we are if a control plane is being bombarded and there are some IO throttling, we get alarmed and proactively sc uh, assign additional IOPS to the block volume, and uh, that that that's how we handle this currently. Yeah, I, I think it always feels like you can hit the same amount of IOPS via network attached, but IO latency is there's still a pretty big gap there that's hard right. to overcome. Right. I think I'm over. Um, so thanks for joining the uh, uh, talk and honoring me with your presence. Thanks a lot.